Good evening. Welcome to this, the third in a series of lectures that I've called Darwin's Descent. Tonight, we're going to learn about the secrets of Darwin's greenhouse. The first thing I want to talk about is the idea of a garden or a greenhouse as a retreat. Darwin, of course, published The Origin of Species in 1859, and the next book that he came out with, I think most people were expecting, would be a book about human evolution. But that wasn't what Darwin did at all. Instead, he came up with On the Various Contrivances by Which British and Foreign Orchids Are Fertilised by Insects, and On the Good Effects of Intercrossing. He explained in its introduction why he had devoted over 400 pages to an incredibly detailed study of orchid fertilisation. Having been blamed for propounding the doctrine of natural selection without giving ample facts, for which I had not sufficient space in that work, in the origin, I wish here to show that I have not spoken without having gone into details. I don't think anyone could complain that the orchid book was short on details. But others suspected Darwin might have other motives. The Saturday Review, when it reviewed the book, said that they suspected it would escape the active and often angry polemics that Darwin's previous work had aroused. So perhaps uh, the Orchid book could be seen as a retreat from the more controversial topics, another attempt to duck the vexed question of human evolution. Certainly I think it's difficult not to see Darwin's greenhouse and his garden as something of a retreat. There's a contemporary photo the way it looks now, and I certainly think, as I said in an earlier lecture, that Darwin took considerable pleasure um, and found it very relaxing working in his garden, doing an experiments and so on. It was also, of course, a retreat from a certain sadness. Uh, Charles and Emma Darwin married in 1839, and then, like far too many Victorian parents, had to deal with the very sad spectacle of watching several of their children die when they were very young. Their third child, Mary, died just a few weeks after her birth. Annie Darwin, possibly Darwin's favourite, died when she was just 10 years old, and their last child, Charles Waring, only lived for about two years. So maybe Darwin is partly trying to escape that sadness, find something... Uh, a little more peaceful and uh, relaxing to do than struggling with the complexities of evolution and the controversies that it aroused. But what I want to argue is that, in fact, it makes more sense to think of the greenhouse as a laboratory, as the place where, more than anywhere else, Darwin put natural selection to the test. And the botanical books that he wrote, there were six of them altogether, um, tackled questions of how nature looked, how it looked different when it was seen through the lens of natural selection, and what that perspective brought to an understanding of living things that earlier perspectives hadn't. He said in the book on orchids that this treatise affords me also an opportunity of attempting to show that the study of organic beings may be as interesting to an observer who is fully convinced that the structure of each is due to secondary laws as to one who views every trifling detail of structure as the result of the direct interposition of the creator. Darwin is being characteristically rather careful and quite modest here. He's not saying the old ways of looking at orchids are completely nonsense. He's simply saying this is as interesting. But of course, the direct interposition, interposition of the creator brings him close to the vexed and distinctly controversial subject of the theological implications of evolution. In Britain particularly, and in other parts of the world too, there's a very strong tradition of what's called natural theology. This is very simply the idea that when we study nature, we are studying God's handiwork. God made everything, and therefore his uh, presence is visible in every living thing, but more importantly, his benevolence, the nature of God is revealed through his creation. And so if you spend your Sunday morning out picking flowers, pressing them, mucking about in duck ponds, uh, collecting things in rock pools, you are as much worshipping God as you were in the morning when you were in church listening to the words of the Bible. In Britain, in the 19th century, this man, William Paley, is the most uh, well-known 
popularizer of natural theology. Uh, and he wrote a famous book on the subject where he uses a watch to explain the argument from design. This is uh, a later edition where the printer has actually included a diagram of the parts of the watch. Um, and the argument, very simply, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, is that if you found a watch lying on the ground and you'd never seen a watch before, uh, and you looked at it carefully, you would see that it's got all these fiddly little parts. They fit together, and they fit together for a purpose, to tell the time. Therefore, even though you'd never seen a watch being made, and you had never heard of such people as watchmakers, you would have to conclude that they must exist, because the artefact, the object, shows contrivance. It shows forethought and planning. And then Paley argues that living things, like flowers, like animals, are just the same, full of purpose, full of complexity. As he puts it, we admire the flower, we examine the plant, we perceive the conduciveness of many of its parts to their end and office, that's to say their purpose. We observe a provision for its nourishment, growth, protection and fecundity. For the contrivance discovered in the structure of the thing produced, we want a contriver. Where we see design, we want a designer. And for a Christian, that designer can only be God. So as I say, this is a powerful tradition in uh, the way that many Victorians think about religious questions. As we'll see in a minute, Darwin is not buying into that argument. Natural selection is an argument about how you can get design without a designer. And the organisms that he used for it initially were common British orchids um, and eventually more exotic tropical ones as well. And it's years of studying orchids that allows Darwin to show how natural selection works and to criticise the kinds of arguments that Paley was making. Darwin would ra later recall that he'd begun his first botanical research um, around about 1839, just about the same time as he gets married. And that's not coincidental, because the very first subject that Darwin researches is the question of fertility and inbreeding. It's about the same time, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, that he reads this book, Into Marriage, by Alexander Walker. Um, and Walker makes uh, gives all kinds of advice to parents, particularly on how you should choose a partner and which kinds of marriages are best avoided. And in particular, he suggests that inbreeding might cause deformity, disease and insanity. And so Darwin is already a little concerned about the problem of cousin marriage. Is it possibly bad for the children to breed with someone who is so closely related to you as he and Emma are. And then those deaths, those sad deaths that I was talking about over the course of his life are going to lead him to think ever more carefully about these questions. And as we'll see in the next lecture, his thinking about human behaviour and human responsibilities to do with reproduction and marriage has its roots here in the greenhouse, in the garden and the experiments that he starts doing very early on. But initially, he's starting with this claim of walkers that inbreeding is bad for the offspring. And he tries to test it by taking ordinary common garden flowers. The red campion down in the bottom corner here is one of the first that he worked on. And he does very simple experiments. He takes some flowers and he cross pollinates them. So he takes pollen from one plant and puts it on a different plant. And in others, he self pollinates them. And the self plants just means he takes their own pollen and uses that to fertilize them. And then he sees how many seeds are developed. And then he tests those seeds to see how fertile they are, how many of them germinate successfully. And he does little experiments on how hardy they are. So he'll take the plants in the autumn as it's starting to get cold out of the greenhouse, put them in the garden and see how well they do. And what he discovers persistently is that cross fertilized plants produce more seeds. Those seeds are more hardy and they're more fertile than those of self pollinated plants. And that's really the starting point for all his botanical research. You remember the orchid book is subtitled on the good effects of intercrossing. And Darwin's experiments convince him that natural selection is going to favour anything that promotes cross fertilisation. And the argument here, I think, is, is quite simple, but very simply, Darwin, like everybody who has watched things grow in the garden, who's bred animals, who's had children, will notice that offspring never exactly resemble their parents. They vary. Darwin is very upfront. He doesn't know why they vary. He doesn't know what causes that. All of that work what we would now call genetics, comes much later. But it's clear from observation that they do vary. 
And these variations are, as Darwin understands them, random, by which he means that one that benefits an organism is no more likely than one that harms the organism. So you get random variation, but the survival of those variants is not random. It will depend on whether each variant allows the organism to reproduce more successfully. Anything that improves its chances of surviving and reproducing will pass on to this offspring, whatever the advantage was. The analogy, it's depressing to have to think about this, but obviously at the moment we're dealing with coronavirus and we're all aware that there are new variants of coronavirus around. And when coronavirus mutates, as we would now put it in modern terms, randomly, some of those mutations will allow, they make the virus more infectious. And by definition, that means it's going to spread more quickly. Other variations are going to make the virus less infectious, less likely to spread, and of course, those variants die out very quickly. That's exactly the same process that Darwin is talking about. So because the cross-fertilized plants produce more seeds, and they're more fertile and they're hardier, anything that favors cross-fertilization, any tiny variant, is going to survive. And generation upon generation, those variants are going to be accumulated. Each, vari each generation starts varying again, um, and if you've already got a variation that has, for whatever way, increased the start chance of cross-fertilization, there's a chance you're going to get a slightly better one in the next generation, and so on. Very slowly, very gradually, over millions of generations, you will see change, and eventually, in Darwin's argument, entirely new species will evolve. And it's no coincidence that fertilization runs through his books. So as well as the fertilization of orchids, there's the second edition of it there where he brought in tropical plants. Uh, but he writes a whole book on the cross and self fertilization of plants where he does detailed experiments proving this point, which is so important to his argument, but is also, as I said, so personal in terms of his own life and his own marriage. In The Origin of Species, he took some of those early experiments and he'd made this claim that close inbreeding diminishes vigour and fertility. These facts alone incline me to believe that it is a general law of nature, utterly ignorant though we may be of the meaning of the law, that no organic being self-fertilises itself for an eternity of generations, but that a cross with another individual is occasionally, perhaps at very long intervals, indispensable. And these are the claims that he made, which he said he was criticised for. And that's why he comes back to the subject in the Orchid book to prove this point with much more detail. And broadly speaking, he goes through the Orchid kingdom chapter by chapter, species by species, looking in detail at how orchids work. So he would take uh, something like this, Orchis mascula, the common English purple orchid, and describe exactly how an insect moves in order to pollinate the flower. And it's kind of nice, you, Darwin describes in detail how he would take a little feather and poke it into the orchid and see what actually happens to the various parts. So you, you really get the sense he's saying to himself, well, now if I were an insect, what would I do? And at other times you can see him thinking, now if I were an orchid, what would I do? So there's something very kind of intimate and sort of tactile about the way he thinks, and that comes across in his writing. And the result is complicated diagrams like this, where he's uh, partly dissected the plant to show the insides of it, all the different bits and pieces. I'm not going to go into a detailed exposition of orchid biology, um, but Darwin certainly does. Um, and one of the things that's nice about this is that he's constantly encouraging the reader to try this for themselves. So he does this little experiment where you can take a sharp pencil and you can poke it down the throat of one of these orchids, and it comes out with these strange little things stuck to it. These are called pollinia, pollen masses, and they're attached uh, by these little thread-like structures called corticals. And at the bottom, where it's marked K in this diagram, there is a sticky disc. And these are glued to the insect's head. And what Darwin realizes, which is quite extraordinary, is that as the glue dries, it contracts and it causes the corticals to bend in the position you see at the bottom there. So the pollinia are now pointing forward instead of straight up. And it takes a few seconds for that to happen. Because of course, if the insect emerges with the pollinia sticking straight up, it's going to fly into the next flower and the pollinia are just going to brush against the pollinia of the next flower. The male parts are going to brush the male parts, no fertilization. This process, which Darwin calls depression, where the corticals bend and the pollinia end up pointing forward, means that when it gets to the next flower, uh, they're going to miss the pollinia in that flower and they're going to attach to the female surface and pollinate the flower. And it, because it takes a few seconds, 
that increases the chances that the next flower will be another plant. And so it increases the chances of cross fertilization. And these extraordinary mechanisms, Darwin argues, have been built up very slowly and gradually over millions of generations. Anything that favours cross fertilization is going to spread. And as he goes through the Orchid Kingdom, he picks up all kinds of contrivances. That word contrivance, remember Paley's word, it comes up again and again. So this is an example of Cypripedium, a lady slipper orchid. This illustration, by the way, is from a book that Darwin's grandfather produced um, on the loves of the plants. So there's a long-standing family business, botany. Um, and he points out that a small insect could crawl in but not out. And so the labellum, that's the enlarged lower flat petal of the orchid, acts like one of those conical traps with the edges turned inwards, which are sold to catch beetles and cockroaches in the London kitchens. And so analogies with artefacts, with things made by people, just as Paley used the watch as a metaphor, they get repeated in Darwin's orchid book. And that mm, catches the eye of some of the reviewers, in particular this one, George Campbell, the Duke of Argyle, reviewed orchids. Argyle is a very prominent and articulate defender of natural, of natural theology. And he wrote that Darwin used the words contrivance, curious contrivance, and even beautiful contrivance, expressions which recur over and over again. And he argued that the intention, intention is the one thing which Darwin does see and which he seeks for diligently until he finds it. So in other words, Darwin sees design because there's a designer and that designer is God. And even Darwin, notorious uh, critic of religion, as he's known already by the stage, can't help seeing what is there. Where we see contrivance, we want a contriver, is Argyle's argument. Others take a rather different view. For example, this man, Asa Gray, professor of botany at Harvard University, a very close friend of Darwin's and an important collaborator in his work, wrote to congratulate Darwin on his beautiful flank movement with the orchid book, which is gradually winning over naturalists who had been critical of evolution just a few years earlier. And Darwin, I think rather delighted, writes back to him, of all the carpenters for knocking the right nail on the head, you are the very best. No one else has perceived that my chief interest in my orchid book has been that it was a flank movement on the enemy. And Darwin says, the more I study nature, this is elsewhere, the more I study nature, the more I become impressed with the contrivances and beautiful adaptations slowly acquired through natural selection. Even though they've been produced by nothing more than random variation and that struggle for survival, these adaptations, he wrote, transcend in an incomparable degree the contrivances and adaptations which the most fertile imagination of the most imaginative man could suggest with unlimited time at his disposal. So given the enormous amounts of time that nature has to play with, those tiny, apparently insignificant variations are accumulated by the force of natural selection, producing these contrivances. So what Darwin has done really is argue we can have design without a designer. That, in a nutshell, is what natural selection does. Hence, it's a flank movement on the enemy, the natural theologians. Now, Darwin's work on plants doesn't stop with orchids. And I want to briefly talk about some of the other things that he worked on, including carnivorous plants like this one. This is a sundew. Um, and uh, the greenhouse becomes very important to this work. So not long after orchids appears, Darwin writes to Joseph Hooker, a very close, very good friend of his, telling him that my hothouse will begin building in a week and so also, and I am looking with much pleasure at catalogues to see what plants to get. Uh, incidentally, this is the way the greenhouse looks today, and you can see this is exactly the same greenhouse. Those black pipes down the side there are the, where the steam came through, which heated it, creating what in Victorian plants was called a stove, kept a tropical heat so you could grow all kinds of exotic tropical plants in your own back garden. And Darwin said he was longing to fill it just like a schoolboy, and he hoped that Hooker might be able to help. Well, if you wanted a little help filling your greenhouse, Hooker would have been a really good person to go to. As we'll see, you know, Darwin tells him, I fancy I shall beg for the loan of some few orchids, especially for Acropera logisii. I fancy orchids cost awful sums, but I must get priced catalogues. Hooker wrote back, 
You will give me deadly offence if you do not send me your catalogue of the plants you want before going to nurserymen. <laughs> Hooker, by this stage, he's known Darwin for many years. He's deputy director of the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew, so he has tremendous botanical resources uh, to offer his friend. Um, and they've been corresponding for more than a decade. Hooker is, in fact, the very first person ever to hear about natural selection and becomes a very important, friendly but critical sounding board for Darwin's ideas. Nevertheless, despite Hooker's generosity and his uh, joking reference to being offended if Darwin doesn't come and beg plants from him, Darwin finds he can't get everything he wants, even from Q. Uh, so Catacetum, one of the orchids that he's interested in, Q hasn't got any, um, and Hooker uh, wrote, uh, Darwin rather writes to Hooker to say, I've written to Vetch, whose name you mentioned to me along with Park and Williams for four kinds. If he fails, I will let you know, as I wish intensely to see Catacetum. Um, and this is an orchid catalogue um, from Vetch, who runs the Royal Exotic Nurseries in Chelsea. You can see here the prices. Orchids are pretty expensive. And there is a kind of an orchid mania in Britain in the 19th century with tropical plants being collected in distant parts of the world, shipped to Britain, um, fetching enormous sums. And the presence of this mania and all these different nurseries supplying it is very important to allowing Darwin to get hold of the plants he needs. So. Uh, Britain's global networks, networks of trade, imperial networks and so on, a crucial tool that Darwin brings to bear on the botanical problems that he's interested in. And when he publishes his book, he uh, actually thanks various uh, um, nurserymen, Parker Williams and Vetch, who have generously given me many beautiful orchids. So he, you know, he's, he's always drawing on these networks of other people who can support and help him and provide him with the materials that he needs. Nevertheless, Hooker is the big source, and where he goes to visit Kew, he has a list of what he wants, and when the plants arrive, he writes to say he was fairly astounded at their number. My hothouse is almost full. I have made a list of plants, 165 in number. You can really get this sort of sense of glee, Don's excitement about getting all these plants to put in his new greenhouse. Um, and he even jokes whether such a raid on Kew's resources might not lead Hooker to ending up in the police court. <laughs> Um, when he explains to Hooker what he wants, he says he's going to focus on curious and experimental plants. I think Darwin loved all kinds of plants and all kinds of flowers, but he's only got limited space and he has particular questions that he wants his plants to answer for him. As he notices, notes in a later letter, I'm getting very much amused by my tendrils. It is just the sort of niggling work which suits me and takes up no time. <laughs> classic modest understatement on Darwin's part. What he actually produces is this book on the movement and habits of climbing plants. It starts out as a long journal article, expands into a full-blown book, um, and it is full of page upon page of meticulously careful, detailed experiments setting out uh, what he's learned about these plants. So it takes up no time, it's complete misrepresentation, but he obviously loved doing the work. And what he found was that um, climbing plants vary in the level of specialisation. Some will simply scramble up whatever's to hand. Um, but Darwin is fascinated by the group he calls tendril bearers, which seem the most specialised. This is a photo that I took myself in Darwin's greenhouse at Down House. Once Corona is over and you're allowed to go back and visit English heritage places, Down House is one of the places I strongly recommend, but go in the summer when the flowers are in bloom. And you can see next to the flower here, that little spiral, those are the tendrils that Darwin's talking about, specialised adaptations, contrivances, which allow the plants to um, move. And he notes they're incredibly sensitive. He writes of one that a loop of soft thread weighing one thirty second of a gram, that grain, that's 0 0.002 grams is enough to trigger a response in the tendril. And the tendrils move and they wave and when they detect something, they wrap around it, and they pull the plant up. Uh, so the plant can sense the light, it can sense gravity, and it can sense by touch the things that are close to it. It's a very different picture of plants to the traditional one of, you know, they just sit there doing nothing. He experiments with them, and he's particularly fond of this one, Passiflora gracilis, the crinkled passion flower, recorded that the movement after a touch is very rapid. I took hold of the lower part of several tendrils and then touched with a thin twig their concave tips and watched them carefully through a lens. 
The movement was generally perceptible in half a minute after the touch, but once plainly in 25 seconds. And he accumulates all kinds of examples like this. So the plants can not only sense their surroundings and react to them, but they can move quite rapidly when they need to. Uh, and I think this may have been his favourite climber. It exceeds all other climbing plants in the rapidity of its movements and all tendril bearers in the sensitiveness of its tendrils. Now, the other kind of curious and experimental plants that he was fascinated by are carnivorous ones. There's another photo I took in his greenhouse. Very grateful to the staff at Downhouse who've helped me on many occasions uh, with my research and so on. These are Saracenias, an American variety of um, pitcher plant, and the ones um, to the side of them are uh, varieties of sundew. And Darwin looks at all these different plants that catch and as he's the first to demonstrate, they digest insects and actually derive vital nutrients from them. And again, he looks at his catalogues and he's writing to Hooker to say, look, I can buy pitcher plants for only 10 shillings and sixpence. These are uh, Nepenthes found in Southeast Asia, very different to the Saracenias in America, but similar kind of strategy. You've got a bucket like this, you can see the turned over lip at the top, which makes it hard for the insects to get out. They're often slippery on the inside. Many of them have little hairs that point down to stop the insects crawling out. And then at the bottom, there is liquid. Uh, some of them just fill with water. Others secrete their own liquid. The insects drown and are then gradually digested. And again, there's all kinds of variety in these plants and the strategies that they have for kind of outwitting insects, trapping them and eating them. And as you can imagine, when Darwin publishes this, as I say, he's, people have worked on these before, but Darwin discovers more about them than I think anyone else, brings together other people's insights, corrects misapprehensions, provides detailed evidence and so on. And the book is quite widely reviewed. Um, the scientific journal Nature, for example, a very respectable and serious journal, commented on this uh, sort of widespread public interest in these plants. Even the newspapers have discussed the anti-vegetarian habits of some vegetables in the light, airy and philistine manner in which they want to approach mere scientific subjects. Um, but there is a, a, a real enthusiasm for these plants. Lots of people buy this book and lots of popular accounts of them are published. Um, and he proves that the mechanisms they have are every bit as complicated as those he'd identified in the orchid. And it's interesting, they have some of the same qualities of contrivance and deliber deliberation. This is a page from the book where he's talking about the Venus flytrap. The margins of the leaf are prolonged into sharp, rigid projections, which I will call spikes, into each of which a bundle of spiral vessels enters. The spikes stand in such a position that when the lobes close, they interlock like the teeth of a rat trap. So again, we've got that analogy with an artifact, a purposeful artifact made by a human being to achieve a particular purpose. And Hooker, when he describes some of Darwin's work on uh, carnivorous plants to the British Association for the Advancement of Science, he says he's gonna tell them about the carnivorous habits of some of our brother organisms, plants. That sense of kinship with the plant world is quite new in the way people are thinking at this time. Darwin's work has made these plants more prominent and Q, as Hooker explains, has been helping Darwin with his work. It's interesting that he describes the sundew and the Venus flytrap as vegetable sportsmen. You know, a little bit of a joke for a dry scientific meeting, but also I think the beginnings of a real recognition that the plants are much more like us, much more like animals, they hunt actively. And that's a big change in the way people think about plants. And he notes that various observers have described them with more or less accuracy, but few have inquired into their motives. And I think the very idea that plants have motives is really quite new at this time and owes quite a bit to Darwin. So let me try and pull all these bits and pieces together, these different plants and the different experiments Darwin did, and see what kind of picture we get from them. In the insectivorous plants, when he's working on things like the sundew here, which has these sticky tendrils that react to touch by enveloping and crushing and then digesting an insect, he describes it to Asa Gray as my beloved Drosera, a wonderful plant, or rather a most sagacious animal. And sagacious, intelligent, aware and so on is a very interesting word to apply to a plant. 
He uses it when he's talking about climbing plants, telling his son William, my hobby horse at present is tendrils. They are more sensitive to a touch than your finger and wonderfully crafty and sagacious. That language of intention, again, borrowed from the animal kingdom. Writing about orchids, he says that uh, an examination of their many beautiful contrivances would exalt the whole vegetable kingdom in most persons' estimation. It would raise them up in our, uh, in our estimation, make us realise just how complex and sophisticated they are, not merely beautiful, uh, but cunning, and so forth. And when the movement of plants, the very last botanical book that he publishes in collaboration with his son Francis Darwin, becomes a distinguished botanist in his own right, carrying on the family firm, as it were, he, Charles Darwin described the tip of the plant's embryonic root, the radical, as, having, as possessing the power of directing the movements of the adjoining parts. It was hardly an exaggeration to say that it acted like the brain of one of the lower animals, receiving impressions from the sense organs and directing the several movements. So what Darwin, I think, is saying in all these different ways is the gap between animals and plants is not that big. But of course, his books are not that accessible. They sell pretty well, and he's very happy with the royalties, but they're very much for specialists. Darwin says in the Orchid book, I fear, however, that the necessary details are too minute and complex for anyone who has not a strong taste for natural history. Uh, when I was first researching this, I was reading it, and I started chuckling, and my wife was like, what's funny about orchids? And Darwin had actually written, I have now explained, perhaps in too much detail. <laughs> And as my wife points out, there's something Darwin and I have in common, probably the only thing that still talking when everybody's done listening. Um, but for those who don't have a very strong uh, taste for natural history, all kinds of people were willing to step in and explain and popularise Darwin's ideas and make them more accessible and interpret them even more vividly for wider audiences. One of the best examples, and I, I have lots, but time is short, is this man. Uh, John Ella Taylor wrote a lovely book called The Sagacity and Morality of Plants. As one reviewer said, many would have laughed at the notion that trees and flowers possess any sagacity or morality, and yet those who have gone deeper into the matter know that something akin to a reasoning faculty exists among plants. So this is not a joke, this is a serious botanical work. And Taylor explains that botany no longer consists in merely collecting as many kind of plants as possible, whose dried and shriveled remains are too often only the caricatures of their once living beauty. Instead, it is now a science of living things and not of mechanical automata. And that contrast, they're not mechanical automata, again, perhaps subtly hints at notions of agency, intelligence and purpose in the plant world. And he actually spells that out very clearly in the book. Hosts of common plants constantly perform actions which, if they were done by human beings, would at once be brought within the category of right and wrong. There is hardly a virtue or a vice which is not its counterpart in the actions of the vegetable kingdom. Successful climbing plants have Climbing habits have been acquired, and the devices thus developed undoubtedly partake of the character we should call sagacious if animals had displayed them. What shall we term them when they're possessed by plants? And if the plants really possess some form of intelligence, do they then not perhaps bear some responsibility for their actions? Taylor noted that successful climbers may even strangle their competitors so as to ensure they're not themselves over top, that's to say, to make sure they keep up in the sunlight. And the plants had, he suggested, cheated and strangled and done all kinds of vegetable crimes before it satisfied its own ends. Again, that language of intention and purpose is very vivid there. And one reviewer noted that while the book was a charming and attractive volume, such things as pitcher plants were a tragedy of plant life and a terrible example of vegetable guile in the commission of murder with malice aforethought. And, and of course, you know, a lot of these remarks are made tongue-in-cheek. People are joking, they find this entertaining and so on. And yet they're also transmitting quite a serious message uh, at the same time. Perhaps the most remarkable result of this new way of looking at plants comes from the work of H.G. Wells here. Um, I 
found this online and rather amuses me that Wells was famous enough to appear on a cigarette card. Um, which these were printed and given out free with cigarettes, basically to try and encourage people to smoke more or to switch brands. So getting on a cigarette card would like, you know, be having half a million Twitter followers today or something. You'd, you'd really arrived once you were on a cigarette card. Um, but Wells produces this remarkable story, The Flowering of the Strange Orchid, um, which gets republished several times. It makes it into the early pulp science fiction magazines and places like that. And what he does is he pulls together the idea that plants are crafty, fast moving, have purposes, even sinister ones, that they devour animals and so on. And he imagines a, a kind of mashup of all Darwin's different kinds of plants in this sort of vampire orchid that sucks the blood out of human beings and actually kills them. Um, and it's quite a success. Uh, as I say, it gets reprinted, it gets translated, and it inspires other frankly, slightly less talented writers to emulate it. So you actually get a kind of genre of killer orchid and killer plant stories that really explodes post Darwin. Um, this is an example from the Strand magazine, this is where the Sherlock Holmes stories first appeared, a very successful fiction magazine. Fred White wrote this story called The Purple Terror, very derivative of Wells's um, story. Again, this is a vampiric uh, tropical orchid that attacks and kills people unless they're very quick thinking with their knives. Um, uh, and my favourite one, this one again from the from the pulps from the 1920s, one of Hugo Gernsback's original pulp science fiction magazines, Amazing Stories, reprinted an H.G. Wells story, but it also prints a new story, The Malignant Flower, which contains this cracking passage. The flower slowly opened and something bright and flesh-coloured shot out of it. What darted so suddenly? Was it the sucking arms of an octopus? Was it the soft arms of a woman? Uh, and there's all kinds of fabulous things we could say about the, the gender of the malignant flower um, and uh, the kinds of anxieties that are perhaps coming to the fore in these stories. We'd be here all night if I started on that. Um, but this is one of the most curious and I think quite amusing legacies of Darwin's botany, these stories. And let's come back to the man himself. He wrote this autobiographical fragment for his family in the 1870s, Recollections of the Development of My Mind and Character. And he makes this comment, it's always pleased me to exalt plants in the scale of organised beings. And obviously there's a very important serious scientific purpose here. If evolution is correct, then all living things have a common origin. And that means every thing that we find in human beings must have some counterpart, perhaps in a more rudimentary, less developed form in the animal kingdom. Every anatomical feature, every behaviour, including morality, including intelligence. And the same is true that everything we find in the animal kingdom must also have some vestigial beginning in the plant kingdom. So Darwin is making a very serious argument as he makes these links, makes these connections between the different levels of living things. So the plants that finally emerge from Darwin's greenhouse, they had needs. They evolved strategies to actually meet their needs. They are predatory, they're perceptive, they're responsive, they're swift moving, and they struggle very actively to survive and to reproduce. And I think it's fair to say that after Darwin, the plant world would never look the same again. Thank you for listening.